In the Chinese text, the nature of medicine has mention of herbs endowed with its essence, but in fact, the essence is not real. On the average, one will become a phantom, a strange being who possesses spiritual powers and can harm people. At the lowest level, one will be a devious person who is possessed by a male ghost. Do you remember that the Kumbanda was a male ghost? Who could cause a paralysis in a person during sleep? The kind of ghost mentioned here takes over a person who is awake and manipulates his body, mouth, and mind for its own purposes. It speaks through the person and can gain complete control of him. These people are what are known as mediums, or they can sometimes become sorcerers or exorcists. In America, I encountered a person like this, an American who said he was Jesus. A minute later, he would announce that God had come upon him to speak, and after a time, he would announce that Jesus had come and wanted to talk to him. It was about five years ago when I came, when he came to see me. I scolded him. I said, "You don't even recognize yourself. You are a demonic ghost." Through. And through, and you are up to no good. He didn't like the phrase "demonic ghost," so he left. He came to discuss doctrine with me, but he never returned after I scolded him. And I thought to myself, I don't know how to talk to people. Why did I scare away that Jesus God? Anyway, that's an example of this kind of devious person. Why do they have that kind of comic retribution? It is because in former lives they stole things, and so they're bound to fall into one of these three categories. Sometimes in China, these mediums were pretty spectacular. They could stick a knife in the crown of their heads and yet not die. The spirit possessing him would remove the blade by the use of a mantra in such a way that the person didn't even bleed. Some would pound nails into their shoulders, and from the nails they would hang several swords, several swords weighing more than ten pounds each. They could hang four of them and then spin them. It was awesome to watch. People were terrified. Sometimes they were really talented. I've seen a lot of these devious demons and adherents of externalist ways. When you look into the Suragama Sutra. You will realize that long ago, the Buddha described all the different kinds of beings in the world very clearly. Therefore, having heard the Suragama Sutra, you should be able to recognize whatever you come up against. This session is called the Four Clear of Unanswerable Instructions on Purity, and it is an extremely important passage of this sutra. So pay close attention. If one can't stop stealing, one will find it impossible to become a Buddha. However, much one hopes to become one. Now that we understand this doctrine, people who do steal should change. Those who don't should not let thoughts of stealing arise. That is how to be most in accord with the way. Sutra. These devils also have their groups of disciples. Each says himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. Commentary. These devious arts are are phantoms, demons, gods, and weird beings, and the Li, Mei, and Wang Liang ghosts that harm people. They all have their groups of disciples. In this world, every category of being has its followers, as it says. The good gather together. The bad form gangs. People fight people who are like themselves. So even these devious ghosts and demons must together and have their devotees. Each says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. They do not recognize what is truly supreme, but instead contend that their way of doing things is the best. They say they have attained the highest way possible, even to a point that they take the Buddha's name in vain and say that's what they are. 
just take a look at the magnitude of my spiritual powers they are due, but in fact they are phantoms. They are phantoms, demons, ghosts, and weird beings. They are thoroughly improper in their conduct. Sutra. After my extinction in the Dharma Ending Age, these phantoms and apparitions will about spreading like white fire as the surreptitiously cheat, um, surreptitious cheat others. Calling themselves good knowing advisors, they will reach say they will each say that they have attained the superhuman dramas, enticing and deceiving the ignorant, or frightening them out of their wits, they disrupt and lay waste to household wherever they go. Commentary I've met very many of these demonic ghosts. Westerners may not be too familiar with these strange things, but it's not just that they come to be because Chinese people believe in ghosts and spirits. It's just that, as time goes on, the strange phenomena that appear in the world become more numerous. After my extinction in the Dharma Ending Age, these phantoms and apparitions will about. Shakyamuni Buddha is telling us here that the age we live in will be plagued with such devil creatures. The we people shouldn't have to see things for ourselves to believe they exist. There are simply too many things in the world which one will never see. If we had to wait until we had seen each and every one of them with our own eyes, we wouldn't be done looking in this lifetime. There are some things you just have to take others' word for. They spread like wildfire as they surreptitiously cheat others. They will be like a fire that, li that literally burns people up. People who don't recognize these devious beings will fall in with them and it will be just as if they had stepped into the, the raging fire. The people will be burned, secret and hidden means they will go about treating others. Calling themselves good knowing advisors, they will each say that they have attained the superhuman dramas. They will speak of themselves as bright-eyed good knowing advisors. Superhuman refers to a bodhisattva. In other words, they will say they are bodhisattvas. In Buddhism, even though you are a bodhisattva or even a Buddha who has come again, you cannot say that you are a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. You must keep silent about it so long as you live, down to your last breath. I'm a Buddha, I'm a Bodhisattva, I'm an Ahat. You cannot speak like that. Anyone who speaks like that is a demonic ghost, just like the ones being described here. When can you let it be known? After you die, then people ought to know. But you cannot let people know who you are before you die. What meaning would there be in your announcing that you are a Buddha? What meaning you say you are a Bodhisattva? Why? What is your meaning in saying so? There could be no other reason than to get people to believe in you. And why would you want people to believe in you? So they will give you money. You do it to take advantage of situations and climb on conditions. If that's not your intent, then why would you be telling people you are a living Buddha if you are a Bodhisattva? Fine, you are a Bodhisattva. What would you be doing telling people so? That reminds me of something that happened once in China. An official once went to Kuo Ching Monastery on Tian Tai Mountain to ask question about, um, questions of the, about Feng Khan. The official and the abbot chatted. What was the official's name? You wonder. Don't ask me. I've forgotten. Perhaps it was, it was you or perhaps it was me. It's not for certain. The official said to the abbot, In the past, there used to be a lot of bodhisattvas who came into the world, but there aren't any in this day and age. I'd like to meet a journeying bodhisattva, but I can't find one. Robot Feng Khan said, Oh, you want to see a Bodhisattva? 
We have two here. I introduced you to them, and you can go see them. The official was dully surprised. Two bodies at us right here. Do you mean ones made of clay or carved wooden ones? No, replied the abbot. These two are flesh body, flesh body bodhisattvas. They are living bodhisattvas. No kidding? Asked the official. I'm the abbot here. Would I joke with you about a thing like that? Who are they? One is the cook and the other boils the water. One is named Han Shan and the other is named Shi Zhe. One is a transformation of Manchu Sri Bodhisattva and the other is a transformation of Universal Worthy, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. They practice ascetic practices in this temple, doing manual tasks. They do the things that no one else likes to do. If you want to see them, it's quite simple. Just go to the kitchen and you find them there. The official asked the guest prefect to take him to the kitchen. There they found two grimy, tattered monks with long hair and beards, dirty faces, and a generally disreputable appearance. But the abbot had said these two were bodhisattvas, and so he dared not look down on them. Instead, he bowed to them. What are you doing? The two demanded. Why are you bowing to us? Abbot Feng Khan said you were transformations of Manchu Sri and universal worthy bodhisattvas. So, of course, I'm bowing to you. Feng Khan slapped his tongue, by which they meant he was a busybody. He said too much this time, so as the official bowed, they backed up and backed up and backed up. One knows not how great a distance, probably several hundred steps from the kitchen to the rock cliff at the base of the mountain. Then they said, Feng Khan has slapped, flapped his tongue. You didn't even bow to Amitabha. What are you doing bowing to us? Who's Amitabha? asked the official. The abbot is. His Amitabha Buddha come again. Go bow to him. Leave us alone. As the official stood there in amazement, the two grimy monks took one last step backwards and disappeared into the rock cliff. That place is now known as Moonlight Cliff on Tiantai Mountain, the spot where Hang Shan and Shi Tu disappeared. The official hurried back into Guo Qing Monastery to bow to the abbot Feng Khan Amitabha Buddha, but when he arrived inside, he felt that the abbot had sat down and entered the stillness. He entered Nirvana. The official now knew that the abbot had been Amitabha Buddha come again, but it was too late. He failed to see what was right before his eyes. Amitabha Buddha was already gone. Why don't Buddhas and Bodhisattvas let people know who they are when they come? If Everyone knew everyone would be bowing all day long, one after one another, to the point that it would be pretty annoying. There would be no time left to cultivate, so they don't want to let on who they are. That's the way it is in Buddhism. One would never say, look, I'm enlightened, I'm a Buddha. People like that are no different from the ones being discussed in this section of the Sutra. I've never met anyone who admitted he was enlightened. Neither Elder Master Su Yun nor any of the other enlightened monks in China ever said a word about being enlightened, even if asked directly. There's no such thing in Buddhism, except perhaps in New Buddhism. In uh, the beings discussed here claim to be superior people. Do you know who I am? I'm Maitreya Bodhisattva. Do you know who I am? I'm Kwanshin Bodhisattva. Now that you know, you should not miss out on this opportunity. Bow to me as your teacher. If you don't want to bow to me, you can bow to my teacher. I'll give you a certificate and for $65, I'll transmit a Dharma to you. They go about enticing and deceiving the ignorant. They confuse unsuspecting people. I've met so many people like this. Their line is, I've done my treasures. 
I sell you one for only three hundred dollars. It's only because I like you so much that I've saved it for you. If I were not fond of you, I wouldn't offer it to you. So the disciple gives the teacher three hundred dollars in exchange for a treasure. Some hit you up for a thousand dollars. Soon the old teacher's wallet is fat. When he moves his stash from safe to safe, he has to use a train. Most people fall for this kind of thing. If you speak true drama for them, such as "Don't kill," they don't believe it. "Don't steal," they don't believe that either. "Don't be lustful," they don't believe that either. But if you tell them you've got something that will be to their advantage, they pay you for it, or frightening them out of their wits. They make you lose whatever wisdom you had. They make you confused. They disrupt and lay waste to households wherever they go. They're really filthy rich, but everywhere they go, they keep amassing more wealth, stripping householders of their gold, lock, stock, and barrel. Sutra, I teach the bishops to beg for their food in an assigned place in order to help them renounce greed. And accomplish the body way. The bishops do not prepare their own food, so that at the end of this life, of transitory existence in the triple realm, they can show themselves to be one returners who go and do not come back. Commentary: I teach the bishops to beg for their food in an assigned place in order to help them renounce greed. When it was time to beg for food. Each bishop had it in a certain direction and met his brows in a certain local. Carrying their bows, the bishops went out to receive alms. Why did the Buddha teach them to beg for food? First, when the people give food to people who have left the home life, they can ensure ensure the reward of blessings and put an end to their suffering and distress. Second, when bishops go out for alms. They eat whatever they are given. If it's good, they eat it. If it's bad, they eat it just the same. In this way, they get rid of their greed. And you cook for yourself. If you cook for yourself, you think, "What I made today wasn't so good. Tomorrow, so I make something delicious. The day after that, I make something even better. And the day after that, I make something simply spectacular. There's no end to it." When one goes out begging, there's no chance for selection. One does not make distinctions about which food and drink is good and which is not. One cannot say, "The food I've gotten today is really tasty," and then eat with great gusto. And then the next day, if the food one gets is not good, one does not even eat it. That kind of conduct is the impermissible. One eats the good and the bad. General idea is to eat one's fill and forget about it. That gets rid of greed. In this way, they can accomplish the body way. That is because, as he said, the superior person is concerned about the way, not about food. People who come to investigate Buddha Dharma should not get hung up on food. The bishops do not prepare their own food so that at the end of this life. Of transitory existence of the triple realm, they can show themselves to be one's returners who go and do not come back. They only want to eat enough to sustain their bodies. Our life in this world, whether we dwell on land or in water, is like a stay in a hotel, transitory and soon over. Don't be attached to it. The bishops put an end to greed, so that when this life in the triple realm is over, they won't have to come back. This place is filthy. I'm not going to return here. Is their thought? Even America, with its beautiful toilets and magnificent houses, is enough to have been here once. Don't come back. Don't be greedy for toilets. To begin with, they smell bad. Why would you be greedy for them? In fact, this whole world stinks. Stinks. You should not think it is a clean place. This world is a toilet in itself.